And ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome here this evening to our February lecture. And on behalf of the Tower of the and our production society, I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome. Um, the subject tonight of the lecture is the origins and history of the Irish National Stud uh, from uh, 1900. 1900. 2021. And while we don't have in Carlo um, a major race course as such, uh, uh, we are certainly surrounded by major race courses, particularly, uh, of course, the Curra, which is the home of the Curran uh, Racing, um, um, it's, it's the racing centre for them, and then, of course, Ford Park, Crown Road is a very popular. Uh, um, uh, race course as well, and Wexford is not so far away. Um, and of course, the horse industry in this, where just on the borders, the centre, I suppose, of national home training is just down the road with the Mullins family who have really uh, dominated in, and I, I mean that in their very best sense, uh, they have, they have uh, really won so, so, so many races, uh, major races. And last year I had the privilege uh, of a very, on a very wet March evening of uh, being in uh, Dr. Bridge when uh, Gallagher Bichon came back after winning the Golden Cup. And, um, and I think that happened, that, well, I know that happens on a regular basis, uh, Grand National winners and all sorts of uh, great uh, celebrations. And the oldest centre is that in Dr. Uh, in Bridge. And I suppose this evening too, it's appropriate to express our our sympathy to the Mullins family on the death of Mrs. Maureen Mullins, who was a wonderful, wonderful lady. Um, the only thing I can claim to say that I shared with her is that we went to the same hairdresser <laughs> and was here in Carlo. And I always enjoyed, uh, I didn't know what happened, but I, I was only going to get my hair cut. I mean, she did a good job altogether, but she always looked much better than I did when we were leaving. And uh, for a great lady, and um, and and I uh, have many accolades that we paid for. So we do express our sympathy to the whole Mullins family because it's quite a large number of them, and they're all very much involved in the uh, in, in, in the um, racing industry. So the only thing that Carlo, I suppose, we we have famous point points, and I suppose the most famous being Kenistown, point point of the world, is, and uh, the Kenistown. Uh, point, point. It's extremely famous in its day. This evening, we are uh, delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Declan Monn to give this lecture to us. Declan is from uh, Tullamore in County Offaly. Uh, as a, a mature student and former construction worker, he completed the Leaving Certificate in Leash Offaly Adult Education, uh, BC. In 2013, in 2016, he graduated with a first class honours Bachelor of Arts in History at Maynooth University and a taught master's degree in 2017. Declan was awarded a Doctorate of Philosophy in Irish History at Maynooth in 2022. He has completed a six month uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowship of honours. Professor Tom O'Connor at the Arts and Humanities Institute at Maynooth University. And he also works as a graduate, uh, a graduate teaching assistant with the Department of History and occasionally with the Department of Library Education at Maynooth. I think since 2013, that's quite a, an achievement. And they can. Yes, uh, I'm here. <laughs> I have to run out the door. I, I, I'm quite amazed at that, at that achievement. I have just done. You're leaving cert in 2013, and then to be uh, to achieve your doctor later on, a uh, uh, great achievement. Thank you. Um, so we look very much look forward to his lecture here this evening. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I um, introduce Dr. Declan Bond. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to thank Carlo Historical Society for giving me the opportunity. Um, it's um, a real honour to be able to talk about the research that nearly drove me mad for five years. Um, the first thing I want to say, I suppose, is I have no connection whatsoever to the equine industry, all right? So I have no background in anything like that. Um, 
But what I will say is Cheltenham starts this day three weeks. We're in Carlo. Um, there must be some tips for Cheltenham out there somewhere. <laughs> I would greatly, greatly appreciate them because I am known to bet on a horse here or there, right? So all tips will be taken on board. Um, the presentation tonight is divided up into um, three different timelines, all right? I'm going to give you the, the most important points, or some of the most significant points from 1900 to 2021. Um, but it's divided up into three sections, all right? The first section is from 1900 to 1916. That's when Colonel William Wall, uh, Hall Walker had it, all right? He is the man who actually founded the National Stud. So a little bit about him, because he's a very important person. In 1916, he gifted the stud to the British government. Okay, so we look at how the stud developed, especially through the times in the 1920s when Ireland was very volatile, up until 1944, when it became the Irish National Stud, and Britain went on their own way and set up the British National Stud in Britain. And there are the, there are the three sections. A lot of people ask me; they always ask, oh, "How did I come up with this idea of doing like, conducting research on the National Stud?" And that came from an undergraduate module I was doing with Professor Terence Dooley, he subsequently became my PhD supervisor. Terry was doing a module on the land question, and the 1923 Land Act came up. And under the 1923 Land Act, stud farms were disqualified from the terms and conditions. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And the National Stud was mentioned. So I said, did anybody ever write anything on it? And I'd done a search, and there's not that much written at all in it, for a paragraph here or there. That's all it is. Conor Ryan has a book on it, the Controversies of the National Stud, right? More recent, it's about more recent times, and we will touch on some of the controversies tonight. I don't want to labour on them too much, all right? And Conor Ryan has done a really good job on that, and he was good enough to give me all his research, in fairness to him. He's a head guy with the prime time investigates at the moment. Um, so, so what was this research built upon? I just want to show you that before we move forward, all right? Um, and as you can see, it's built from a lot of different files, okay? From the National Archives in Dublin. Also, as you can see up here, the National Archives in Kew. And it was really good to be able to get a sense of each government's agenda. I mean, the British government have their own agenda, the Irish have theirs as well. But there's also in-house fighting between the Department of Agriculture in Ireland and the Department of Finance. And the same goes on in England. They're not agreeing over what way the studies, as you will see soon, the way it should be developed. So that's really interesting. It's supported then by um, a lot of other sources there, as you can see, from university, all the usual type of things, Trinity and places like that, all right? Um, one second now. Lots, lots of newspapers, of course, as usual. Um, so we'll just move along to who William Hall Walker was. That's in there, obviously. Um, he was born in 1856, all right, on Christmas Day. Kind of unfortunate to be born on Christmas Day, but anyway, that's either here or there. Um, he was one of eight boys, all right? Six girls, or eight boys, sorry, I have that wrong. Six boys and two girls, I might have right anyway. Um, his father was Andrew, Andrew Reed Walker, um, and he owned a very, very popular brewery business in the Warrington area. Um, it's quite famous for, you'd be quite familiar if you watch Carnation Street and soaps like that, you'll see the brewery system where people come in and they can rent out their um, the pub off the breweries. The walkers developed that system. So that's what they're familiar with. Andrew, the father, died in 1893. He left property to the equivalent of 200 million. Just think about that in today's terms. So these are very wealthy people, okay? The other son inherited the business. Peter, or William Hall Walker, the other son that developed the National Stud, he's the managing director of the brewery in Warrington. He was an honorary member of the British Army. He served on Liverpool Council for 19 years. And he was also an MP for 20 years, um, a Conservative MP. He married um, Sophie Sheridan and had one adopted daughter. Um, these were very influential people, right? They, they would have hosted the, the likes of King Edward often on, on occasion. I think King Edward is quoted as saying he had one of his most enjoyable afternoons with these, with the Hall Walkers. So that gives you an idea of the kind of people that you're dealing with, all right? He was honoured in 1919 with the title Baron w Wavertree. Um, it's interesting to note, William's father absolutely hated horse racing. I mean detested it, did not want his sons having any, anything got to do with it. That's because there was a social stigma attached to gambling, okay? Gambling is seen as a real lower class sport, and the father didn't want any association, but that didn't stop the sons. 
The three sons rallied against their father, as to do. William went on and done a lot of pony racing. He became very successful. The older brother had a stud farm um, in the area, as had the other, another brother, John. Um, so William was caught up in all that. So he, he, he kept his love for horse racing. He kept, he kept it up. In 1895, he won the Grand National with a horse called the Sarah. So that was a real boost for him as such. Now, in England, the Jockey Club, who are in existence since 1750, are in charge of all horse racing rules and regulations. But the Jockey Club in England is a very stifled type of... It's full of all the aristocrats, landed gentry, all the type. They're not very progressive. So Hall Walker's looking over at Ireland, and he sees there's much more movement and freedom in Ireland to be able to do what he wants. So he decides, he's looking at trainers like Henry Greer, who later is involved with the stud, we'll talk about him soon, JJ Parkinson, Richard Dawson. These are all famous trainers, I'm, so, I'm sure some of you would have heard of. And he's seen, God, Ireland could be a good place for me to launch my stud farm from, rather than caught up with what's going on in Britain. In 1900, um, he purchased Tully Stud from James Fay, 1,000 acres up around Tully, all right, the periphery of the core. For, 20, for 2,000, for 2,800 pounds. It was very dilapidated, the estate, and needed an awful lot of work. So he invested 54,000 into the estate. It wasn't long before there was success on the race course. Um, in 1905, a horse called Cherry Lass won the Oaks and the 1,000 guineas. Um, he won five races in 1905, um, also in Royal Ascot, which was really impressive. Prize money totaled 81,980 um, and an average of about 10,000 per year. And a correspondence in, this, in, the, in the sportsman, as you can see there, just said, as if by a ma uh, wave of uh, a magician's wand, it has been transformed into as perfect and breeding nursery for bloodstock the world over. So he's making waves, um, quite impressive. He's a very <laughs> strange kind of a character, William Hall Walker. For instance, if he got horoscopes delivered to himself every single week for his horses, would you believe? A bit like the star signs that we have now, okay? If a horse was born underneath an unlucky horoscope, he got rid of the horse. Now that seems to me a bit far out. He got rid of a horse called Prince Palatine. Prince Palatine went on to win the dirt of St. Ledger. So that was a bit of a foolish thing to do. But that's Hall Walker for you, in fairness. Um, he had a very close friendship with who we know as the Aga Khan the Third named Prince Aga Sultan Sir Mahub, Ma uh, Muhammad Shi. And it was through his friendship with Aga Khan that Aga Khan developed his stud farms in Ireland. He has, three, he has had three stud farms in and around, around the Kura region. So, um, and it's really down to his interaction with Hall Walker. Um, that's, why, that's why he came over here to Ireland. Um, in 1905, at the annual Jim Crack dinner, that's a dinner that's held every single year at the end of the year, it was very interesting to note that Carl Walker called for government intervention um, in horse breeding. The government are supporting the likes of light hunters, but they're not supporting the thoroughbred industry, okay? They reckon it should be left in the private breeders' hands because thoroughbreds are notoriously hard to predict what's going to happen. You could have the greatest bloodlines going, but the horse isn't as often, the, the progeny is not always successful. So, and you'll see this, I'm going to tease this out a little bit later on. Is it okay for governments to be investing money in Torbets? I'm not so sure. I'll let you, you can decide that yourselves, all right? And the Royal Dublin Society in Dublin had some, had some um, schemes running, but they were very poorly financed. The Department of Agriculture here in Ireland, the Technical Instruction Department, also had some schemes, but again, not covering Torbets. What kind of seems to refocus the minds of the British government at the time was there was an influx of American jockeys and trainers into Ireland and there was a big fear that the American horses were going to take over the Irish bloodlines here so what the Irish or the British government done they introduced what was called um, the 1913 Jer Jersey Act it was a new stud book was introduced that all bloodlines had to be traced of British horses only so that snookered the American owners from bringing the horses over here um, so that would have refocused our minds and maybe, maybe we should set up something, some kind of a state inter intervention somewhere, somewhere along the line. In 1907, Hall Walker bought Rusty Park in Swindon. So he extends his interests out of Ireland. He's still in Ireland, but he buys Rusty Park 
in Swindon as another stud farm and runs it there and leases out quite a lot of the property. He had a lease with King Edward in 1909 for a horse called Minoro. Minoro won the Derby. So again, this gives him great, terby, uh, great um, credibility. The leading sires in Tully, at Tully Stud were horses called White Eagle, was probably the most famous one. But he produced a broodmare called Blanche, who produced another horse called Bran Blanford. Anybody who knows anything about racing, Blanford was one of the top sires in the 1930s. You trace really spectacular bloodlines back to him all the time. Okay, so that's he sired 11 British Classic winners alone. So that's a real testament to Hall Walker's knowledge of horses that he was able to produce him. Um, in 1915, Hall Walker decided to donate his stud farm to the British government. And the reason he gives us here, he says, one of my principal reasons for making the gift was that by the government becoming interested in the industry, they would be more easily influenced in seeing the necessity of racing being continued in the interest of light horse breeding for the country. And I was able in my private capacity as a member of parliament in touch with these matters to use a certain amount of persuasion which had the desired result. So he's trying to get the government, he's, he's offer, he, he offers to the government and he's hoping to get £75,000 for 60 horses. Now, it's debated in the Parliament in Britain, and there's some ferocious opposition to it, okay? None more so than this man here, Edmund Montagu. He's the Treasury Department Secretary, all right? And you can see what he says. He's really, I mean, he's kind of vicious. I mean, there's, he says, there's nobody in the Board of Agriculture, with the exception of Selborne, who's the President of the Board of Agriculture, who has a good word to say for it. I am further informed that there is an allegation that Hall Walker, who is posing as so many other money grubbers do as a patriot, is in reality offering to sell his horses to Holland at the same price to the government. Absolute tripe. That was not going on, okay? That's not true. Um, I don't know why. I was intrigued by why Montague was so much against Hall Walker. So I've done a bit more research. And in Margaret Asquith's diaries, who was the wife of one of the ex-Prime Ministers of Britain, she alleges that he had a serious gambling problem. So it's quite interesting. So maybe the personal stuff. And he had a breakdown after and all. And, that, and um, he had a lot of stuff going on. So, But I found that very interesting. Um, in the end, Hall Walker got very browned off, wetting around, and he withdrew the offer of the stud farm. He said, I'm out here. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm withdrawing the offer. I don't want to. But he was Lord Selborne, who he had the, um, this man here. He had his approval. He reconvinced him to that he convinced the British government to come on board and they accepted Hall Walker's offer, okay? Um, Rusley Park in, was part of the deal, obviously. The lands in Tully, of course, are part of the deal and the horses. Rusley Park, very interesting, and there's a lot, there's actually room for quite a bit more research. In fact, someday I might come back to it myself. It was used as a remount depot for horses during World War I, and really interesting, it was run by women, women only. So that's something that somebody should be Sat there's, only, there's only a blog post written about nothing else. Somebody needs to do something there. Um, so any ideas, if you, you know, work away. Um, moving on to the next sex section, all right, which is from 1916 to 1945. The British government advised um, that the National Sud should keep running as it was um, under Hall Walker. Of course, they had to find somebody to actually run the stud. <coughs> And this is the man that they picked. His name is Henry Greer. He's a very close friend of Hall Walker's. Um, he's running Brownstown Stud on the Corra for a number of years, so he's quite familiar to the Irish racing scene. Um, he's from County Tyrone. He will be classed as a loyalist, unionist, um, member of the jockey club. Fortunately for him, he lost two sons in World War II. That's tragic, really sad. Um, he spent 17 years at Brownstown Stud, as I said. He won the Derby with a horse in 1889 called Tragedy. Oh, how ironic, later that he loses sons in the war. Um, he served in the Irish Senate from 1922 to 28. Um, and he received a knighthood for his services to racing in 1925. Um, really interesting kind of a guy himself. I write a lot more about him in, in much more detail in the PhD. Um, this is a man called Henry Cecil Lothar, better known as the Yellow Earl. Okay. Very flamboyant type character. Lord Lonsdale is what they call him. Yeah. 
He, for the British government, didn't want the responsibility of taking on the horses here in Ireland, so they leased. This is a very wealthy guy who comes from a background of coal mining in England. He inherited all that from his family. Um, but he's a notorious, extravagant spender. Um, you might, Lundsdale, if anyone knows anything about boxing, Lundsdale belts, these are his. That's, he, he, he created that because he's a sports fanatic. Um, but at the, he actually, at the end, he actually lost all his money. He died with penniless, nothing. He squandered the whole lot. But at the time, it suited the government to get him on board, and he leased the horses. And he had them for over 20 years. Um, at this stage, the Treasury Department in, are very concerned about com uh, the company finances. They suggest that we should close the stood down completely. But the, bar the Board of Agriculture disagreed. And within a couple of years, the stood returned to profit. The next problem that was faced stood faced was naturally the instability in Ireland in the 1920s. I mean, here we essentially have a British-run establishment sitting in Ireland in the 1920s in a volatile atmosphere when the Irish drive for Irish independence was at, was at full flow. Um, and that was commented in the press. They were very critical of issues regarding the stud and who was going to own it. Concerns were raised on how the national stud in Ireland could serve Britain as a national institution, if under an umbrella government controlled by Sinn Féin. They were worried Sinn Féin obviously didn't get in, but there was worries that they would at the time. Others noted that if the stud was under the control of a Sinn Féin government, there would be no benefit of those living in Ulster. Um, so there's quite deep worries, all right? Um, racing wasn't really affected by the hostilities, which is quite amazing. Um, Maybe it's because the horses were such valuable commodities at the time of transport and this time. There was, but Bresen, in general, there was a few disruptions. Sinn Féin uh, hijacked a few meetings and stuff like that, but there was never any... There was somebody who was shot in the turf club, but he was a former linked to the British Army. But there was never any real violence apart from those kind of incidents. Michael Hines makes a very interesting comment there, if you read it at the bottom. He says, horse racing has allowed Irish Protestants and Catholics to co-participate co in a sporting activity without killing each other. Not an insignificant achievement. That's really loaded comment, you know. And I love the part Irish Protestants. It's only lately, and it's only in the last 20 years, research from the likes of Ida out there, Ida Millen, Dr. Millen, has done a wonderful book on the Irish Protestant experience. I mean, when I went to school, all we ever concentrated on was the green-white section of the flag. We seem to forget that there's an orange part of it. Thankfully, in the last 20 years, and onwards, we're starting to see a different. There's a dual Irish identity. And that's really important. Um, I'm always telling my students that we need to be thinking, not this tunnel nationalist type of education I was given. Um, it's, it only explains one side, and that's not the way history is. You need different angles, different approaches, and give a balanced view at the end. In any event, that's my little rant on that over. <laughs> um, am I going the wrong way now? No. Now, Greer is quite concerned about the stud, especially with Sinn Féin hovering around. Um, he was concerned that the stud could be sold or controlled by the free state government only. He speculated that stud could continue in England with the property at Tully um, retained on an operational basis. Crucially, he wrongly believed that Hall Walker um, wanted the same thing. But Hall Walker didn't, and I have it in a letter. Hall Walker was quite happy to let it go to the free state government. And that's very interesting, because Hall Walker could see well, if I let it go to the Free State Government, it has a chance of developing and a lot more and thriving if it ends up with the British, and he could probably foresee the problems. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, in any event, Sinn Féin did not get into power. Okay? The Cumann Gael government did under W.T. Cosgrave, and he was a huge friend of Irish racing. He really was. But not only that, what I like about Cosgrave especially is the, the inclusive nature of him. He included... 16, to 20, 16 of 20 members of his Shannon were Southern Unionists. That's really interesting. Um, fair play to him. Um, horse breeding schemes were improved. District stallions were provided in various areas. Um, but by the mid-20s, mid-1920s, the battle over who actually owns the stud was, was becoming quite contentious. Um, in May 1923, Patrick Hogan, the Minister for Agriculture in Ireland, left no doubt onto the government's position. And you can hear what he said, like you can read it. 
I hope this doll is not under the impression that the National Stud is not an extremely useful institution. All I want to impress on the doll is that the National Stud is a most useful, valuable acquisition, and we do not propose to allow it to be interfered with or its usefulness impaired in any way. So he's laying on the line um, to the British government. In 1926, the ultimate financial settlement of the actual Anglo-Irish Treaty um, was finalised. And quite interesting, Clause 6 states, excluded from this financial settlement is Kilmainham Hospital, the Royal Hibernian School and the National Stud. They have real long history, historical links to Britain, but they're excluded. So if you like, I suppose, the National Stud has still been run by Britain. Ireland have an interest, but it's in a kind of a purgatory now. It's been, you know what I mean, if you know, that's been held, and there's no real decisive owner on it. Um, in the 1930, the Department of Agriculture in Ireland favoured leasing the stud. They said, look, it's, that's the better way to go. Um, but that's not what happened. In 1932, we have a change of government. Eamon de Valera comes in. De Valera is a totally different, and he's a different agenda, so you have to, it's fair enough. But he abolishes the Shannon. That to me is not progressive, but that's what he done. We have to appreciate his agenda. He was driving for full independence. He starts an economic war, it has huge impacts across a lot of Irish stud farms are closed down, some trainers leave and go to England. Um, a year later, the Irish government, or the British government suggested the, the, the stud should be closed because it's getting far too hard to control. Um, of course, you have the impacts then of the worldwide recession coming from the 1929 Wall Street crash. So lots of stuff going on. In 1933, Hall Walker dies, and a year later, Henry Greer died. Um, He's replaced by a man called Noble Johnson. Noble Johnson was an assistant at the stud for a few years. He was manager of Eustace, Lo Eustace Loader stud in Kildare for many years. Eustace Loader would have produced a horse called Pretty Polly, famous horse. If you look him up at all, um, you'll see. Um, in 1935, there was a commission of inquiry on horse breeding in Ireland. It's the first of its kind. Um, JJ Parkinson was on the panel they found that there's a big fall in figures in the quality of thoroughbreds in Ireland and recommended that breed breeders made stallions with mares with promising <coughs> careers only. And there was a, crucially, there was a recommendation to create what was called a central stud. Um, but the Irish Department of Agriculture ignored this for two years. No answer was at all. There was no, nothing said. No reference whatsoever to a central stud. So that didn't obviously sit too well with them. They argued that the national stud was of no use to the schemes in Ireland. Um, it was said that thoroughbreds are, thoroughbreds are too costly for ordinary use compared to sires like hunters, and that's factual. Um, they reiterated to lease the stud to the private sector due to its speculative nature. And there's a good compelling argument to be made, that that's the way it should be. Two years later, the Irish Department eventually re responded about the central stud. They said it was too expensive and objected against it. They suggested much more interaction with the private breeders. So we have a stalemate now, it's not going anywhere fast. In 1935, there's a conference. Both sides meet up in London, try to come into agreement over it, but they can't come to it. And it ends up in a lot of legal stuff that I'm not going to get into here today. I have it in the PhD, but they're arguing on key legal points. It's boring, but for a legal historian, it's lovely. But I won't bore you as day, okay? But some actually fascinating arguments are put forward. The Irish government see they're getting over. They say to the British, okay, since you're not willing to hand us over anything, we want rent for the period back to 1916. British government very taken aback with this, but they agree. But the crucial aspect of this is there's no agreement on the bloodstock. Nobody cares about the National Stud of Land, right? It's the bloodstock. The bloodstock, the thoroughbreds are worth a lot of money. And it's their progeny and all this. That's what the, that's the key issue here. Um, in 1937, Johnson dies unexpectedly. and He's, he's replaced by Peter Burrell, Related to Eustace Loader. He was an assistant at Noble Johnson's Loader Stud. Um, now, sorry, I'm just a little bit lost there on that one. Oh, yeah, sorry. I lost my train of thought there for a minute. Apologies. Um, in 1940, this is the Aga Khan again, all right? He's quite important. Um, he owned thoroughbred races, obviously, horses in Ireland. Um, he 
he had a total of 16 winners of British Classic Races. So he's a very influential trainer and owner. He was the British Racing Flat Champion 13 times. But in 1940, a letter that I found in the files in Kew, he offers his stud farms in Ireland to the British government. Now, the British government, this would have had huge implications in Ireland. Can you imagine there would have been the national stud owned by Britain and three more stud farms in the Curragh region, also owned by the British government? That would have caused serious problems. The British government stall on the deal, of course, as these, anything, anybody ever deal with a department anywhere of government to always know everything has to be sent from one place to the next before a decision is made. What happens is Aga Khan pulls back from the offer. Um, he says he's financially and crippled and he's in terrible. The letter is really graphic on the, on the amount of money that he needs. He's in an awful bad way. But he rescinds the offer anyway, and he gets, he, he doesn't, he doesn't sell the stud firms in the end. But it kind of refocuses the governments to try and come to a solution on the stud. Um, this, the lease with Lunsdale um, falls through. The British government ended with him because he's becoming a liability. His spending is out of control. His money's nearly gone. When you have money, everybody wants you. When you have no money, nobody wants you. Bye bye, Lonsdale. So that's what happened with him. Um, the British and Irish government, there's a couple of really top class stallions called Bahram, another one called Mah Mahmoud, and another horse called Big Game. Big Game. They're national stud horses. They're due to be retired to stud. So the British and Irish governments are looking very closely, saying, who's going to benefit from the progeny of these? What's going to happen? Um, this guy, John Mathby, De Valera sends him over. He's a British diplomat. He's a very close friend of De Valera. He acted as a kind of intermediary. And a deal was actually brokered between both governments. The Irish government was given land at the National Institute and they were paid the rent arrears of 21,000, whatever it was. But the blood sock passed to the British government. Now, you could argue that that was they let go too quickly, but this was going on 25 years. So they had to let the blood stock go. It would never have stopped. We would have, we'd still probably be there today, you know. Um, that's just a quick graph. I won't bore you too much with it, but it just shows you the profits and losses of the stud um, over the period of time. And if you look at the yellow, it's doing quite well. It's, good. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's in profit. Um, okay, in the 1930s, it's not. But we can blame our friend De Valera for that because of his economic war. Got him very harsh on De Valera, I think. But some Fianna Fáil fans out here to be throwing lemons and stuff like that, you know, in a minute. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, that's when we can see it was losing a bit of money. And you can see towards the end of the 1940s as well, just before they reached agreement, the stud was becoming quite stale. So it's now become, it's now set up as the Irish National Stud. The British, set, the British set up their own stud in England called the British National Stud. I intend to do more research on that. I intend to do more research on the French National Stud, the German National Stud. That'll all come in time. Um, but at the moment, um, we're grand. Um, a public limited, limited company had to be created to create the National <coughs> Stud. Um, so there was share capital needed of 250,000 with bank borrowings of not over 100,000. But before this could be created, there was intensive Dahl debate. And it's in the Dahl debate you can really see um, and learn an awful lot about how the Stud should have been run. There's a lot of criticism in the press first saying that you should not mix politics with public limited companies. So that's a fair argument, in fairness. Um, there's robust debate in the Dáil. Sean T. O'Kelly, he'll be president in a few years, he encourages his involvement with private breeders. The stud owners in Kildare are horrified because nobody consulted them. How dare people go ahead with a stud and not consult us? Senator William Cork considers it deeply inappropriate to interfere with private breeders' interests. And small breeders should have no access to their stock. That's what he claimed. Um, Senator Gerald Swedenman, which is a Fine Gael, a very interesting amendment. He wanted an amendment to the National Stud Bill. He wanted complete transparency from the stud because it's a semi-state company. He wanted all nominations, everything all printed out, all declared. And he was actually right because when you see what's going to happen here later on, the total lack of transparency at the stud caused all sorts of trouble. And remember what I said here a moment ago, the stud is set up for small breeders. That's not what happened at all. Um, the Studs First Board has a mixture of nationalists and loyalists. You have the likes of PJ uh, Hayes, PJ Rooksley, Rooksley, Lean Hayes, the Earl of Fingal, and Charles Moore. That's good. 
Um, Major Cyril Hall is the new CEO. CEO. He ran a stud farm in Oscar for years, and he's a regular on the Irish sales scene, so he's well known. Cosgrave's son, Michael, is the first secretary. So that link has been created. That's important. The most immediate problem the stud had is, like all stud farms, if anyone knows anything about it, you must find um, a really renowned stallion. If you have a renowned stallion, what do you attract? You attract money to get people to send their mares or whatever to be covered. Um, Royal Charger won two group race, r r races, but he's quite renowned si um, sire. There was new stud management courses introduced early as well. Um, and the National Stud horses were leased to the president in his name. So all the horses would have been, that were running underneath the National Stud were running in Irish names. You'll notice that quite a lot. In 1953, Charles Lester, famous breeder, he questioned the stud fees at the National Stud. He argued there's absolutely nothing unique about the stud. So I said, hmm, is that a sweeping statement? Us historians hate sweeping statements. So I looked at some of, you see the graph there, okay, and you get a visual fairly quick from this. If you look at the red, the red is the National Stud's charges per cover, okay? A cover is when the horses, the mare covers, or the stallion covers a mare. But if you look at the charges for the National Stud in red, they're quite similar to, there's not that much of a difference, is there, between the stud fees, between the National Stud and anywhere else. In fact, the National Stud's a bit dearer in places, um, in fairness. Just, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm sure, the pri sorry, the private breeders are in red. Sorry, I have that wrong. I'm going to get your colour on and get my colours right. The private breeders are in red, and the National Studs, they're the fees into their colours, right? So there's not that much of a variation. Charles Lester is correct. So what's unique about the National Stud? Nothing. Zilch. Um, they may not like me saying that, but that's, that's, the, that's what the research says. Also that year, Tullyar, a horse some of you might have heard of, was purchased for 250,000 from Maga Khan. He's a famous horse, won the Derby, the King George, really reputable horse. There was another new National Stud Act that was needed to buy that horse. A lot of debate in the doll about it. Um, there was 80, 80, 87,000 people unemployed in, in Ireland at the time. The arguments were, should we be investing 250,000 in a racehorse who may not be successful? Solid argument. Um, the Irish economy is in a poor state in the 1950s, obviously. A couple of years later, Royal Charger was sold. Um, I can't, there's no real reason for that. That was an un unjustified sale. Um, he was bringing in a lot of money for the stud. But you have to ask yourself questions, why has he been sold? Remember, there's a lot of private breeders on the National Stud Board. Isn't it very, it's very awkward to have national. Who does the private breeder represent? His interests are the interests of the National Stud. Do you see where I'm coming from? It's a very awkward one, isn't it? You know, now that's, that's the repetitive problem here that we're going to see as we go along. Um, Royal Charger had a very good stud record. He covered 125 mares with a fertility rate of over 79%. If you compare him to another famous horse called Arctic Prince, he had a very good cover rate. So his selling them was not justified. Um, in 1954, Hall resigned from his position and he went off to work for the Aga Khan. Um, he's replaced by this guy, David Hyde, veterinary inspector from the Department of Agriculture. In 1953, Tullyar is sold to American breeders. There was uproar in Ireland because Tullyar is a loved horse. He really caught the public's imagination. Um, but the, it seems to be a pattern that the National Stud are starting to follow now, starting to sell any top quality bloodstock that they have. In 1955, there was a huge controversy over a horse called Panaslipper. Um, the National Stud bought him, they increased the share capital that stood to buy him again. He was sold to an American called Neil McCarthy. And for some strange reason, they didn't tell the government. The government learned from it in the press. So you can imagine how that went down. So Gerald, James Dillon, the Minister for Ag Agriculture, and Gerald Sweetman met. Neil McCarthy arrived over in, in Ireland, demanding to know because the sale was delayed what was going on. They met him off the plane. They pleaded with him and begged him, please do not go and buy this horse. Can you put it, explain to him? He, he gracefully stood back, stood back, but he wasn't happy. That's not a way to run a government. That's, that really dragged us down to, just, it's just poor policy. Just, but that's not surprising the way this place has been run. Um, in 1959, De Valera places O'Kelly as president. 
And they're just some of the prophets from 1947 to 1969, okay? So again, you can see the red bits where it's losing. Um, the prophets are good in times. Um, when, I'm not going to labor too long on that, but it's just visually you can see. Of course, we all recognize who this is. Um, Charles Hottie, he's, he introduces a stallion um, exemption in 1969, which may, makes all stud fee, fees exempt from tax. Um, that lasted until about 2008, when it was the European Court, we were brought to the European Court and that had to be taken away because it was seen as un an unjust advantage. That led to, to, it led to high level breeders becoming very big in Ireland, the likes of Sheikh Mohammed brought his some of his studs over here, the Darley studs, Coolmore stud really rose to fame. Um, it's interesting that, what I find really interesting about Charlie Hawhey is, politicians at this stage were only earning, let's say, what a teacher would earn in the 70s, 60s. Not like nowadays, they're earning a hell of a lot more. But yet Charlie Hawhey at the time had a stud farm himself and lots of horses. That's a fair achievement on a teacher's wage. Ask yourself questions why. Um, and he has his horses at Tim Rogers stood in Lucan. And, lo and Rogers is lobbying him for this tax break all the time, okay? So it's interesting. Oh, he is very close with Coolmore stood. He nominated John Magner. John Magner is involved in Coolmore stood, obviously. You would have heard of John Magner, I'm sure. He nominates Magner to the Senate. He just it was accusations in the doll that Hawhey was a crucial player in the rise of a monopoly in Irish horse racing. Um, again, the National Stud Act in 1969 is created um, to increase capital from 500,000 to 1 million. Robust debate in the Dáil. Some TDs call for a subsidised scheme for the small breeders, um, but that's not forthcoming. This man takes over Michael Osborne, very progressive individual, vet for a decade in Kildare, he was CEO for 12 years, and he made sure that over his time that the National Stud had a full complement of horses, of thoroughbreds. He was really, really, and he introduced a lot of courses, a lot of renowned courses. National Studs are some of the most renowned courses in Europe at the moment. It's down to the likes of Michael Osborne. He's a really, really top-class man, it's a, but he leaves in 1982, and you're going to find out in a minute why. Um, just check times now, I don't want to be dragging this. Um, This was produced in, by Michael McCormick in 1970. It's a publication on the Irish racing and bloodstock industry. Um, McCormick found that 49% of stud farms earned less than 1,000 in cover fees. 67% earned less than 10,000. But crucially, he says, 63% of stud cover fees went to nine stud farms, earning over 200. Nine stud farms. That's a problem. That's a major problem. McCormick concluded that the breeding of high-class stallions was for a minimalist number of stud farms that received the most foreign investment. So there we go. Um, there was another report um, of the joint, another, there was an awful lot of these government reports in the 70s, one in 1978. It was called the first report of the Joint Committee on State-Sponsored Bodies. The correct policies of the National Stud were questioned. National Stud directors were questions, questions um, about the way the stud was been run. Um, Osborne advises that the National Stud cannot compete. Um, he also argued that small breeders were the base of the industry and could rise at any time. That's not true. We've seen from McCormick's research. How could the small breeder rise? He can't. Um, in 1978, the National, the National Stud changes its policies and it enters the syndication market. Beforehand, you, wouldn't, you couldn't you'd buy a horse solely, but now you can buy a horse in syndication. Syndication is a, is a, it's what's done nowadays all the time. Lots of people come together and buy a horse. Um, that's just the way it, the National Stud had to move with the times at that time. Um, in the 1980s, the Department of Finance considers selling the stud. Um, unemployment in Ireland is at 7.8%, up to 18% in 1982. Inflation trebled from 7.6% in 1978 to 2 over 20.4% in 1981. Despite these figures, the National Stud still recorded profits. So some sections of society are not getting affected by this. The state reduced its funding in the stud from 500,000 to 100,000 to zero in 1982. This was much to the dismay of the National Stud directors. 
In March 1982, um, Osborne resigned. He left for America and he returned and he went working for Sheikh Mohammed at Kildang and so on. And that's a terrible loss to the Stud and for him to go to another rival as well as a pity. There was outrage on his departure all over the local papers. Um, and you can see he has the Stud turn, the turnover is really good, the profits are good. Only, only one, one loss can be attributed to him, the other loss that came, came after he left. Um, this man, John Clark, is the new CEO. He's an agricultural graduate from Balls, uh, Ballsbridge, uh, working for Tattersalls in Ballsbridge. Um, there's a trading loss in 1982. Um, there's a report called the Killingham Report that comes forward in 1986. Um, they recommend that the National Stud stop using mayors. Who's on the board of the Killingham Report? John Magner. Why would you ask the National Stud to stop using the mayors? Why? They were quite profitable. You know, it just, it just doesn't ring right. Um, in 1979, the National Stud bought a horse called Ahanora, really famous horse, all right? Um, they bought him for 250,000. From 1983 to 1987, that horse earned 1.8 million in stallion fees. The combined total of all other National Stud stallions was 2 million. He done it on his own, 1.8 million. His cover fee came, went from 12,000 to 20,000 over that period. The stud ends back in profit. In 1986, there's a bid of America refused, so you're saying they're not going to sell the horse. But a year later, they sell Ahanora. His colts at the moment are selling like hotcakes. He's, he's everything the National Stud could want, but to sell the horse, who does it sell the horse to? Coolmore Stud. Why? That's the question I'd like to know. Why would you do this? They'll argue they got four, they got four pint, whatever million it was, but he's everything that the Stud could ever want, the emblem that you need to run your business. In 1990, another government report recommended the National Stud should find themselves a prestigious salon. There it is, a Hanora, they had one and they sold it. It's mind boggling stuff. Um, in 1993, there was another National Stud Act, Lahadal debates again. Um, Ivan Yates was very vocal, as he always is, of course. Um, the National Stud horses were nowhere near the task that Coolmore stood. The National Stud is underfunded. Um, they, had, they have, they become across, they actually get very fortunate, very fortunate in 1994, they come across a horse called Indian Ridge. He was phenomenally successful and he was going to really launch them back. They refused an offer of 50 million for him. He had a heart attack and died in 2006. Talk about bad luck. You know, so he, that's, that's, that's unlucky. Um, profits and losses are stood are there for the 19, from 1982 um, to 1998. Again, you can visually see what's going on there. Again, there's a lot of doll debate. Um, Share capital is increased in 2000 from 10 to 25 million. Um, there's, there's a lot of criticism that the national stud, stud fees are sidelining the small breeders again. The national stud is not seen as on the same level as the private sector. There's complaints about this domination of what we call, what I call elite breeders. There's a lot of issues around governance, bullying allegations. John Clark runs up huge expenses, 800,000 over eight years. John Osborne says they're justified. I decided to have a look at that. And I from I looked at Clark's expenses over the 10 years, the eight years, or whatever it is, and I compared them to 50 National Stud employees. And they only earned 53,000 per annum. That's 50 stud employees, including the directors. But yet Clark could justify 800,000 or at 100,000 per year or something. Not right there, anyway. There's a controversial aspect he gets into a serious court case that's all over the papers. You can read about it with Julia Lynch and another big court case with Pat Malarkey over bullying allegations. I'm not touching on them here because I'm not here to do it. I'm not going to go down the road with that. But I have to talk about them because they're there, okay? And um, he retired anyway in the end in 19, 2010. Um, John Osborne was the man who took over um, from him. That's Michael Osborne's son. Um, He left in 2017. He was replaced by a man called Cahill Beale. Cahill Beale is still there. John Osborne done a lot of good work. I've met John myself on a few occasions. Very nice man. 
and a lot of good, good work on the courses and the national stud. Um, and he really had the national stud interest at heart, in fairness to him. Um, again, profits and losses are there. I know I'm flying through this, but when I eventually get a publication, you'll be able to really delve into this in, 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 in greater detail. Um, I made a freedom of information request and stood in June 2022. I wanted comprehensive details on the stallion syndicates because a lot of the breeders within the stud at this stage, which I haven't really touched on here tonight, a lot of the directors on the board have interests in stood in some of the horses in the stud. So I wanted to know who got the nominations, who were the favourite and who they weren't, under freedom of information and under the fact that it's a semi-state company. But I was refused on the grounds that I would expose the national stud to unfair competition from other breeders. Not acceptable um, by any means or manner. I go into more detail in the, in the, again in the in the in the actual thesis itself. There was a horse called Invincible Spirit. He was retired to stud in 2003. Still there, a very famous horse. The board sold a share of him to Sheikh Mohammed and they made 15 million. And some of the board members made quite a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'd still like to know more details on it, but they're denied. Um, there's a whole other section I have done in this. I'm not trying to show you here tonight because I could... I could present another 45 minutes easily or 50 minutes here tonight on the domination of the likes of Coolmore stood. I have charts here that I could show you here that will show you. They're off those charts of what's going on. How just a small breeder, I, I don't know, some of you might be small breeders, some of you maybe not. How does a small breeder cope in Ireland anymore? The medium size, they can't. They're going to be squashed. Pedro McGuinness, a trainer, was on the rest of post recently saying that the breeders in Ireland, the smaller ones, were finished. On the verge. And this is why my charts, my, my, my graphs have shown stallion fees, winning prize money, all that's been dominated by Coolmore Stud. Now, you might say, well, Coolmore Stud's flying a great flag for Ireland. They're not. Coolmore Stud are flying a flag for themselves. They're shareholders. JP Greenman recently made, who was involved, recently made a one million donation to every GA club in the country. One week after the government awarded 75 million to horse rest. Guess who wins most of the 75 million? Who wins it? Coolmore Stud. They have it sucked out. They win the most of that prize money. They win it. And I have proven that in my charts. I could show you another level of this. So it's not very coincidental. But McManus is cute. Thousand quid or a million quid to every GA club in Ireland. Happy days. Swiss tax registers and residents. Lots of questions need to be asked. In fairness. Just a few con concluding comments, all right? I'm not set about slagging off the National Stud at all, but as a semi-state com company, it was never run properly, and it, could never, it was never given a chance, but it could never compete with the likes of Coolmore, with the likes of Darley Studs. It never had a chance. It, the levels of money that you're dealing with, especially from the likes of Sheikh Mohammed, forget about it, you can't compete with something like that. But also, it never had a chance because a lot of the, and I've only barely scraped it, I haven't really dug into it here, you have to read this thesis to understand where I'm coming from. The private owners that are on the board of the National Stud, as I said to you to start, whose interests are they serving? And it's only, and to be fair to them, they have businesses to run too. So, but they shouldn't have been on the board in the first place. It should have been somebody else who didn't have this conflict of interest. And that's the problem. I would see the National Stud will never compete at the high levels, ever. Never, it can't. It's never going to be allowed to, okay? It's going to be a very good place for research, Anything like that, going forward, that will be where its forte is, but certainly not competing with thoroughbreds. Um, and that's about all I can say on it here this evening. Um, when I do another presentation or another chapter on the elite breeders, this will be ironed out in much more uh, definite terms. I'd like to thank you all for listening. I hope I haven't bored you. Um, and I hope I've given you something to think about, right? That's all I want to do here. It's not about being critical of anybody, but as historians, we're here to uncover our perception of the truth and give a balance. And I've given a, as far as I can see, I've given a balanced version of stuff. It mightn't sit well with too many people. I've said, well, look, elitism. Think of what that is. This is what this is all about. Elitism at the highest level. Look at RTE at the moment. Look at the problems there. I could do a template of this national student. I could compare it to RTE. The governance issues, they're so alike. There's no regard for when private enterprises come involved with the government, regard goes out the window. We 
We see it with the Children's Hospital, we see it, it's unreal. Anyway, that's enough of me tonight. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful place to visit in a program that you have been to. It's lovely. It's a wonderful place. It's a very nice day at the National School. A funny time of the year, really. So, have we any questions for Victor? Victor. Come on, somebody ask something. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe I've said enough. You've covered a lot there, Um I have thought of one either, but I, mm. I mean, you have left me with you, but you kind of have answered those questions. I had to look at, we're construed for time, so I skipped over quite a bit of stuff here and there. But that's just, when the book comes, you can read it and you'll see. You'll see. This will become much more apparent then, all right? Um, yes, John. Yeah. The, the UK National Study, they the same. The, they got funded by the British Levy Board, so they had a lot better funding, but still suffered with the same problem of private breeders' interests. When private breeders have been appointed to their, to their boards as well. Whose interests are they serving them? So there's the same kind of problem there, yeah? You know, it's not a good mix, it really isn't. It compromises everybody, it really does. It's not good. Any other questions? Is the state still funding? Of course, yeah. What you I'm not sure how much, well, good, I'm not sure how much there is at the moment. But there will be, they'll, they'll be giving them so much money every year, but I can't give you a roundabout <laughs> figure. I probably have it in the thesis somewhere, I'd imagine. Just I can't remember offhand now, but they certainly are still funding it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, is it right during recessionary times? It's just, as I said at the start, the speculative nature of, of a thoroughbred, it's so risky. That's the problem. We can never be sure. So should we be, should we, should state money be invested in something like that? I'm not so sure, you know, I'm really not. And there's so much money floating around, like of all these bigger elite breeders. Could they not contribute something? Rather than 32 million to J clubs. You know, that's my point. Christy? Just, uh, not a question, it's a comment really. Quite, yeah. quite an explosive Presentation there tonight, mm. and uh, I think we're pointing in another different direction. You know, Tom Cooper taught a lot. Thank you for that. Yeah. I was thinking of your John Lydon of buying all the land around the country to the very You know, it's the bridal capital for you. Yeah. Well, Coolmore, in fairness, like to win a lot of races, to bring a lot of pride to Ireland, and I've had, I've had some fantastic horses. I mean, so that. And I always hear the flying the Irish flag, but I don't know. I, I don't agree with that. I don't see it that way at all. I see a quite different picture as I painted here. Um, but feel free to say I'm wrong. You know, it's just my opinion. Um, again, if I showed you the five or six charts I have here, you'd see. You would see. The man over in Russia that uh, put his head above the parapet. <laughs> he didn't end up too happy. Oh yes, but you look at us historians. That's what we have to do. Ask to ask the vital questions. I mean, I'll, all, I'll argue. And I'm telling my students all the time. As a historian, if you're not asking serious questions of something, don't bloody well be a historian. Get out, leave the room, find a new job. That's our job. You know, that's what we must do. And you have to believe in what you write. Be passionate, and you'll be absolutely fine. I think in, uh, in yes. this area, there would have been always the tradition, particularly probably maybe more so in Wexford, Kilkenny. Um, I suppose obviously to Prairie, yeah. uh, of small breeders, you know, uh, keeping yeah. uh, farmers who would keep a couple of broodmares. Yeah, all the small ones, yeah. um, Have we any idea of, you know, of numbers? Had we ever any idea how many farmers were in that situation? And well, there's about, you know, there's about 6,000 breeders in Ireland at the moment. Small breeders. Yeah, about 6,000. Well, all together. The elite breeders are kind of on their own, so we won't include them. About 6,000, yeah. So quite I, a lot. And are they still, is that number sort of diminishing or is it? Um... It will be falling away all the time. It will be, since there was research in 1978 by Professor McCormick, you can see how much it's dropping off. Thoroughbreds, 
Breeders are ordinary horses, there's few, plenty. But breeders are thoroughbreds. That's an elite man's game. Yep. Gotta have a lot of money for that. I mean, don't buy a thoroughbred horse. Don't. Unless you've loads of money. <laughs> Lots of nuts because it's a volatile game. Small breeders will be more into the national hunt. Yeah, yeah, well, is, yeah, national hunt racing. Yeah. It's a different kind of a level, you know. Yes. Um, a little bit of elitism there, but I won't touch on that. No. I better not. I'm here in Carlo, you kill me altogether. <laughs> um, but there, it's not all bad. I mean, there's lot, lots of good. It creates an awful lot of employment. There's a lot of good stuff off horse racing. There really is, you know. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff as well, you know, that I've just spoken about. Um, there we go. Yes, Helen. I just have a quick question. Yes, sir. You said that um, the National Stud sold the uh, Coolmore. Yeah. So who instigated those sales if you were wondering about it? Well, the National Stud Board would have. They got out with the cooperation of the government. Yeah, of course. Apart from Panna Slipper at the time when they sold the horse behind the government's back. But was didn't that do the No, it was. No, there wasn't. There was just a lot of. Lecture, a lot of letters going back and forth, giving out you know, the usual complaints, but nothing. In the, semi, in the 80s and 90s, when the, government's, when the governance issues of bullying and all that happened, there was a change of a whole national stud board and all that. But I don't want to labour on those bullying cases. They're personal type of stuff that's all well documented over the papers, you know. And as a protection, actually, because I spoke to one of the victims of it, and she doesn't really want to be spoke about. And to be straight and honest with you, I don't blame the woman. So there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to touch on that. Honestly, right? That's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who on the board? Who of that? Well, uh, um, uh, it would have been the chairman at the time, who was Larry Ryan, I would imagine. He would have, um, well, he would have had to go to the government to get permission to do that. They would have to agree. And the sole they'll argue that they got 4.8 million, that's great. But the, the, new, the, the foundation of Annie Stud Farm is a prestigious stallion. And they had a once in a lifetime stallion here. Remember, they're after selling Tulliard, the sole Royal Charger, sole Panna Slipper, got, got reversed. Here to have Ahanora, the dream ticket. But it's the dream ticket in the wrong place. It's in the national stud. And I know my own opinion is Kulmar seen that and said, oh, we're not having Ahanora, Ahanora in the national stud. That horse is going to be a prolific sire. That needs to come over here because the national stud will become far too powerful. Whose interests have been represented? See what's going on there. You know, I think that's a valid argument, I really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A horse trained in Ireland when it's racist. Yeah. And carry the Irish flag to it. 100%. Not just an Irish owner, not just no. an Irish trainer. No, it's an Irish government horse, really. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, I and mean, they probably, the whole board of the night. Would have agreed, yes. One hundred percent. One person. One, two or more stood. That's just when I seen that I was firing my eyes today. I read that. I'm so annoyed because I wanted to see the national stud built. I'd love to see the national stud thriving. There's a stud farm called Tallyho Stud. I think it's John Magner's sister owns it. Coolmore or his sister-in-law, one of this something like that. Coolmore are kind of in our feeder branch of that, right? Tallyho Stud is an amazing stud. It's it's been run so efficiently. But it has the backing of Coolmore. Could the likes of Coolmore not come in with the National Stud and run something? Because Tally Ho is amazing. It's doing so well. Do you see what could be achieved? Again, I have lots of other research in the PhD which shows this, teases this out further. Um, that's what was lost. So it's very frustrating for the likes of Michael Osborne, all those CEOs down along the way, John Osborne, to be continually banging their heads off the wall trying to get funding, trying to get finance. And they know on their heart and hearts they can't compete. How can you ever compete? Um, there we go. Yes. Uh, just broadly speaking, what do you see the function of the national stud? I mean, government normally don't get involved in things for some yeah. reason. Mm. The transport company, the mm. institution. Is it there to foster racing, or you know, is it, or is it in competition with good people who are? Otherwise, or, well, how does it fit into the government's overall? Uh, well, I mean, they employ the board or they appoint the board and they hope that the board carry out their duties as expected of any, of any stud company to run the stud company as it should. But, but what's the mission? 
You know, the national stud was there to serve the needs of the small breeder. That's what it was set up to do, but it never done that. Yeah. How, how did it see itself doing that, or why did it do that? Because the, at the start in the 19, 1945, they were supposed to introduce lower, lower stallion fees. They were supposed to introduce various different schemes around the country, but they never materialised. Yeah. Kind of yeah, that's the, yes, but that was always details as it stood. But that never happened. Why didn't it happen from day one? Why didn't they set out about it? You know, you have to look at the section of interests involved. Like you say, we really didn't do what it was up to Never, not from day one. Never. No, sure, within six or seven years, we have the proof that the stud fees are no different. It was set up, but we're going to have much better stud fees, much more attractive. Within, but sure, within six or seven years, Charles Esther has proven. My charts, my research has proven that the stud fees were absolutely nowhere near lower, or not even, some of them just, just about match. National Stud is supposed to be a unique organization. But not on this level of thoroughbreds, it's not. It's unique for its courses, running some really good jockey training courses. A really great research center. It's a beautiful place as you spend. I'd encourage any to go to it, it's absolutely. I went up there and I seen Hurricane Fly, working one of few champion hurdles. Stand beside that horse, give you the shivers, because I love horses, love them. Um, so there's an awful lot the National Stud can do. It's been the victim of its own. It was always in the corner. It could never, it could never prosper, ever. Between the, sector, the, the private breeders, between the recessionary periods, between the domination of the elites. It's actually done bloody well well to be where they are today, to be fair to them. Do you know what I mean? So it's not all bad as such. Is that fair enough? Thank you. It provides a kind of service as well, doesn't it? Take in mares for polling yeah, and, uh, and those indeed. for owners. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, lots of stuff like that, yeah. You know, they have their own successful farm there and everything, you know what I mean? So, in fairness to it. Um, Any further questions? That's great, I think we'll, we'll, we, 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 we might uh, come to a conclusion. And thank you so much, Declan. I think you've given us lots of food for thought as well as a very good lecture and highlighted the importance of the, of the, the, the Irish National Stud and yeah. what it should be doing. And